and here we are. Hey, Steve, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Simon. Thank you for your taking the time to talk with me. We've got the probably the worst time zone we could possibly have between here and the UK. <laughs> um, usually, it's at th those three qu three corners of the world being Sydney, London, New York, which we have to find a good time. But uh, I'm really really glad to have sit down with you. Um, yep, today we'll be you. talking about beyond budgeting. Um, okay. Which, uh, you'll be able to help us out a lot. It's one of the capabilities we have on the comparative agility uh, website. Um, but it's something that I think is really, really interesting because of uh, as we move through any sort of agile transformation or anything like that, obviously it's eventually going to come down to the money and the dollars. Mm -hmm. um, but the real funny thing is that a lot of people don't really think about is that there's a lot of similarities between just agile in general and beyond budgeting. So how did you come to beyond budgeting in the first place? Uh, right. Okay. I'll try and give you the five minute version. Or the 50 minute <laughs> version. Um, so I'm, I'm a, a finance professional by background and I came at it. To, so I came into Beyond Budgeting in 1998, which is when Beyond Budgeting Roundtable was set up. Um, and really it came about because I'd, I'd been in a position where I've been financial controller of a large uh, subsidiary of a major FS, FMCG multinational and yep. we'd kind of fixed most of the other processes in finance but there was this horrible stinking pile of poo in the corner called the annual budgeting process which everybody hated and every year everybody said well, it's going to be different next year and it never was so it, it that's that's how it started up and i somebody who worked for me introduced uh, me to Jeremy Hope and Robin Fraser, who set Beyond Budgeting up originally as a cross industry research collaboration. Mm -hmm. And after a few years, I kind of got sucked into that and it then took over my life. Um, so, what started off as a, a kind of attempt to fix a broken process turned into something much bigger. Mm -hmm. um, off the back of that, um, I did a PhD in and around this area and I've written, now I'm writing my fifth book in and around this area. So <laughs> it's provided a kind of lifetime of intellectual um, challenge for me because it ends up being so much more profound than it originally appeared. Mm. Uh, and I'll stop there. So you came at this from a financial background. You from a financial said, background, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and you said that you already felt the, um, the process of annual budgeting, which is very commonplace around the world and kind of, you know, even mm. uh, kind of almost built into our system by that yearly tax cycle. Um, but you felt that was yeah. not the right way to do things. What context drove you to that decision in your career? Well, it, it's... Uh, it, there are the, the kind of challenges that people normally see is that it takes an enormous amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, everybody recognizes the uh, political game playing that gets um, triggered by the budgeting process. And then when everybody collapses in an exhausted heap after six months, everybody ignores it because it's out of date. Yeah. 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 So that's been my experience. Yeah, it's just a complete and utter waste of time <laughs> and energy and drives so much bad behavior. And mm -hmm. it sits right at the very core of traditional command and control management of the sort that so many people these days are seeking to try to um, change. Mm -hmm. um, but they, most of the people who are trying to change it don't realize how, how securely bedded traditional practices and traditional thinking is in, in, in budgeting. And they, they don't even consider that it's possible to do it differently. They think it's like the kind of Ten Commandments that came down from the mountain with Moses. You know, you can't possibly do anything any different. But it's that's us finance people know that that's not true. It might be a myth 
that finance people are happy to promulgate because it gives finance people an awful lot of power, but it's not true. It was invented. Mm. It was invented yeah, yeah. about a hundred years ago. Yeah. And you know, it's a product of man's mind and can easily be changed. Yeah. I, I say easily. It can be changed. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Well, you've put together a few, um, a few slides to help us understand that. So we'll just switch over to that now. Okay, cool. Um, sharing my screen. So I was what, going to what, get, you, you, you on. I was just going to get straight into, it will help me understand, but I think it's best for us to go to the slides. So, um, because so it is a go slightly, slide, go ahead. Go to slide two first. Yeah. Right. What, what I tried to do with this, Simon is to, is to talk about beyond budgeting within a context that people coming from an agile background will understand and be able to re relate to. Yep. Um, because in, in many ways wh where we start, you know, where we start off with beyond budgeting is, is pretty similar to where people starting an agile journey start off, which is we've got a traditional way of doing things and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, most people within the Agile community will be familiar with the waterfall planning process, which starts off with requirements, goes through design, plan, build, and then you test it at the end. And surprise, surprise, particularly in IT, when you, there are so many things you don't know when you start, that very often fails. It leads to overruns in time, yep. it leads to overruns in cost, and a whole sort of blizzard of finger pointing. Mm -hmm. And if you, you click now, and if you just compare that with a traditional budgeting process, surprise, surprise, it starts off with defining what you, where you want to get to, which is targets. You then negotiate a whole set of budgets, which is how you're going to get there, which is analogous to design. Then you build a plan around that. And the idea is if you execute it and you, uh, and you do that in a way that's aligned to that plan, you will succeed and you won't have any variances. I, you won't have, your, your actuals won't be different to plan. Mm -hmm. And if you click on the next, uh, next one, the, the fundamental reason why both those two fail yeah. is they both assume that you can predict the future. Uh, so that you, you know exactly where you want to get to and you know exactly what conditions are going to be like when you get there. And they assume that you've got perfect knowledge of how to get there, you know, how to yep. build your, your, your software, how to, uh, how to execute your plan. And, you know, it was probably never the case that those, those assumptions were correct. Sometimes they're more correct than others. So if you, if you say building a bridge and you built lots of bridges before and it's yep. what yep. you do is constrained. I was going to say the that. The yep. laws of physics, yep. you know, a traditional waterfall planning process is more appropriate. But when you are doing anything which is new and by definition, planning a business a year ahead in an environment, which as we, as we see, as we speak, is completely unpredictable yep. you know, it, it just doesn't work you know and your attempt to try to force reality back to your preconceived plan is doomed to failure yeah well this I'm, I'm immediately seeing a lot of parallels that you're drawing i mean waterfall project management is still used in construction but as you said it requires highly on uh, experience if we've built a house, we know what the major risks are. We build it again. As some things have changed, but we manage that risk down very tightly at the beginning and manage it through. Um, but I'm already seeing what you're talking about with the fact that if you do apply that same kind of thinking to, to your business, um, you're just going to have the same year as you had before while the world's moved on, the world's changed. And that puts you in a very dangerous position if you can't um, change with the world as well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So okay. the next slide sort of sets that budgeting uh, theme to music. So uh, if you like, you, you've got, you're an organization, you are interacting with a segment of the market which is impacted by changes to the economy, changes. Uh, Location, like we're having right now. <laughs> yeah, 
your customers yeah and what you 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 what you're trying to do you in a traditional budgeting process you start off by trying to forecast the future so if you click ahead yeah that forecast generates a set of targets mm -hmm. and from that you build a resource allocation plan mm -hmm. um, and and fundamentally what budgeting is about is about the allocation of resources that's fundamentally what it's about and that cycle happens once a year irrespective so if you click on ahead mm. if you if that, locked in. you lock those in place and that is an annual cycle so if the world changes very slowly that annual cycle is maybe far too quick but more uh, more usually the world is changing much more quickly than on an annual cycle so you've already locked your goals down you've locked your resource allocations in in place and call them budgets mm. and it's now very difficult to change and yeah. the way that the process works if you click on ahead is what actually happens you measure and you call it performance you make mm -hmm. typically measure that on a monthly cycle um, and you compare that with where you hoped to be your goals and then if you click again mm. but the problem Thanks. is because you've locked your resources in place called a budget you you can't easily change i mean mm -hmm. theoretically you can but because you've got a very detailed plan where every every component locks into every other component it's very difficult to change um to change and to reallocate your resources and that mm -hmm. and this is one of the major kind of friction points with um, agile uh, product uh, product development is that you know for 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 something to be truly agile you need to change based mm -hmm. upon feedback but you the budgeting system is fundamentally designed to make that a difficult and it's mm -hmm. made worse once you attach um, financial rewards to that as well because not only have you got if you like an administrative problem in changing things you've got a whole load of people who've got a financial incentive not to change things yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely so so that's a kind of very very simple kind of high level explanation of budgetary control so if you'd like to just click on mm. so that's incentives yeah and, and these are the fundamental problems this is just this i'm, I'm now going to stop talking about the budget traditional budgeting yeah it's, we've, got, we've got to be uh we got to be more, we got to be even-handed, but yeah. you, you're making the point, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you're going to sell a vacuum cleaner, you've got to be able to convince people their house is full of dirt first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, number one is bureaucratic and costly. Uh, number two, as I've said, it it is difficult to do the right things because resources are locked in place and change yep. is very slow. But um, almost as important, perhaps most importantly, encourages the wrong behavior because the way you win in a budgeting game is to negotiate the lowest profit or revenue target you possibly can do and never exceed it. Mm. The most stupid thing you can do is to beat your target. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, on the cost side, the way you win in, that, in, in a budgeting world is to negotiate the biggest budget you possibly can do and then make sure you spend it even if you don't need to. Yeah, and, and this is where I see a lot of the behaviors that you've talked about I've actually you know, witnessed and that's why it's very good to have this talk when you have people who um, are going through the budgeting process and they literally have said to me, I have no idea what's gonna be happening in a year's time. Like things change so quickly. And then they decide, okay, well, we just have to put a number in and we'll, we'll kind of figure it out later. So already yeah. they're saying that, I don't know, um, I'll, I will be forced to break the rules later because I know things will change um, and I need to use that money in different ways. But also, as you pointed out there, um, we all know that one of, uh, you know, you got to spend the money to maintain your budget, otherwise it gets, gets removed. And yeah. I've, been in, I've been in projects that someone calls me on, our, our cycle ends June 30. So uh, someone calls me maybe May and says, I need to spend $2 million. You know, can I get my project done? And immediately you're just thinking, wait a minute, where were you three to six months ago when we needed that money? Um, yeah. It's almost like people actually hold things back and push them forward just around that cycle. Which, yes, they do. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, 
So the, as, as you say, the only way that people can get things done is by deliberately gaming the system. Yeah. And where, where you get into a vicious cycle here because the people who run the budgeting system know that people gain the system, yep. which they interpret as, the, as people being untrustworthy, yep. which justifies in their minds them being even more rigorous and narrow-minded totally. about yeah. the budgeting process. So, so you create a problem through budgeting that you can only solve by budgeting more rigorously. Yeah. Um, and it's based on a, so you're generating bad behavior. You're generating criminals, basically. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it never gets that far, but um, <laughs> you, you are pointing out a, uh, a vicious cycle. Yeah, well, uh, there are plenty of CFOs in the States who've ended up in choking. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Um, okay, so the source okay. of the problem you said, uncertainty. Yeah, so the fundamental source of the problem is uncertainty. And un yep. uncertainty I define as the lack of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're in an environment which is fundamentally uncertain, what your, your challenge is how do we acquire knowledge? So if you want to mm -hmm. click on a bit. Um, and the way you acquire knowledge is to do, yeah, you, mm -hmm. you, you potentially might be able to do desk research, but mm -hmm. in practice, if a situation is fundamentally uncertain, the, the, the best way to acquire knowledge is to do things and learn from doing things. Yep. And the key is, and I think the uh, sort of agile development methodology demonstrates this really nicely in, in so far as being systematized, is, is where the, your uncertainty is greatest, in other words, where the greatest risk is, you want to you want to just you want to you want to eliminate that by knowledge as quickly mm. and as cheaply as possible. Yeah. So you front load in a process those bits of the project that are the most uncertain deliberately. Yeah. And I think that's an extremely. I, I doubt whether the people who who kind of uh came up with that rationalized it in this way but that's an extremely sophisticated uh technique for dealing with uncertainty mm -hmm. <laughs> um absolutely and and one that uh and i i think a lot of management is about finding cl uh, simple ways to get people to do sophisticated things mm. clever things and, and that, this is a good example of that okay so um, and the feedback loop is critical here. Mm -hmm. uh, my PhD was in systems uh, stuff, cybernetics, and yeah, you know, we, we systems people bang on about feedback loops all the time. It's, it's I've uh, I've got a lot of questions, but I have a feeling they're coming up in the in the short term, so I'm going to hold back a step. A step. Uh, okay, okay. Um, so um, I'm going to. I think the next slide is going to shows a similar sort of process to the one I did, budgeting process, but within it, in a, in a beyond budgeting context. Yeah. So the, the, the first question I want to, I, I designed these, this way of looking at it to counter a prejudice, which some people have, particularly in finance, which is beyond budgeting means not, not being in control. Mm -hmm. And I believe that you, that, Beyond budgeting is a control system, every bit as much as uh, budgeting is a control system. Similarly, yep. you know, agile development practices, you know, are a control system. They're just a yep. different form of control system to waterfall project planning. Yeah. So it's got the same features, but they just manifest themselves in different ways. So one way of talking about it, you've got this, you've got the organization which is interacting with this market, which is dynamic as, as, as is the case. Um, so if you click on, um, yeah. if, if you like, rather than focusing on trying to predict the future and then manage back to that, if you like, a, a, a change of emphasis in Beyond Budgeting is focusing on what's actually happening. And in particular, um, not trying to measure performance in abstract, measure it in a relative context, which might be relative to peers, internal or external peers, 
or it could be relative to yourself. You know, are you getting better or are you getting worse? Mm -hmm. And you set goals within that context mm -hmm. rather than by some arbitrary negotiation process. So, so we're like talking to, about, okay, we'll increase sales by 10%, that kind of thing. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we've, we've grown by 5% per annum over the last five years. The market yep. is growing at six. We ought to be growing at least six. Okay. Yeah? So mm -hmm. let's start off by setting our, our goal as trying to beat that. Yeah. Knowing that the only way, there is no way in advance you can set a perfect target. Yeah. Yeah. Because COVID-19 comes along and survival yep. is a bloody good target now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So there is always within the, 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 the context of beyond budgeting, a recognition that any goal, you need to have a goal, mm -hmm. something to shoot for. You need to have something that, that enables you to, as a reference point. Um, but you need to recognize that that is always contingent. The only way you know for sure whether you perform well or not is looking back looking back with hindsight when you compare what you've done taking into account what actual market conditions were like yep so that that provides your feedback loop so if you'd like to click through mm -hmm. so you've got you've got this feedback loop of actual performance uh, comparison to your goals and re resource reallocation which is taking place continuously. So if you're in a very dynamic and fast moving market, that, that feedback loop needs to be very quick. If yep. you're in a civil engineering, let's say it, it doesn't need to be uh, quite so quick. So it's driven by the nature of that feedback loop is driven by the, na the, the nature of your environment. But however good you are at reacting, there's almost always a lag in terms of when you decide to act, seeing that impact, seeing the, the impact take effect. Um, so if, you, if the analogy I always use is, if you're in a super tanker and it takes you three miles to stop, yep. um, you can't simply rely upon what you see, you know, 100 meters ahead of you. Yep. You need to look three miles ahead of you. Yeah. So forecast is, is important, but it's driven by the, what engineers, I don't know, if you're a software engineer, you'll know this, driven by latency. Yeah. So the latency in the system. So if you click on, so your forecast process is if you like a kind of future actuals, mm -hmm. which, is it, which is driven by the latency in your system. So in my old company in Unilever, it took 18 months to launch a new product, roughly about 12 months to launch a new advertising campaign yep. and about two months to change price. So you've got, those are kind of key decisions and, yep. and you've got different latencies. And so you need to forecast up to 18 months ahead, but in different levels of detail, depending upon the nature of the decision, which you got, which you, which you're required to make. Yeah. So all of this is a control system, but it's, uh, it's keyed into the nature of your business and the nature of the environment in which you're operating, rather than being a kind of copy paste process driven by arbitrary tax filing regimes or statutory yeah. accounting processes. Yeah, um, I mean, what you're really pointing to in the last, that very last statement is what drives a lot of mindsets is compliance rather than empowerment um, yes. in, a, in a financial sense. And that's where I guess you'd separate leaders from, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the word is, but just the runners of the process. Yeah. Administrators, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, one of, the, one of the attractions of a traditional budgeting process for um, senior leaders in senior people in business uh, most, all of whom have six, got to where they now are by being good at managing the budgeting process is you don't you really don't have to do very much other than set targets yep uh, beat people up when they don't perform and give them lots of money when they do <laughs> it, it, it's it's a wonderful simple uh 
an intellectually untaxing process. It doesn't actually require you to understand the business. Yeah. Um, if, if you're kind of working in this way, there is no getting away from the fact that your success is a product of how well you're achieving compared to your peers, not compared to some arbitrary budget that you've negotiated yep. in a way that uh, makes it easy for you. And the way you succeed is by making good decisions. Yeah. Which is the and way it seems to me integral to this is having extremely clear understanding of your goals and strategies and, yep. and monitoring them regularly. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're, we're going to come on to this in a minute, but I'll just kind of place it, push that there now is that mm -hmm. the, as with agile, um, what, if you like, might have started off as a, a kind of process debate rapidly, rapidly becomes an organizational and behavioral debate. Yeah. Because a traditional budget environment, I mean, as you said, just like a traditional waterfall planning is all about compliance. Yep. You know, you actually don't want people to think and use their initiative. Yep. Uh, whereas if you're in an environment where you're learning and where you want to react quickly based upon what you've learned, all of a sudden the people inverted commas lower down the organization become really important mm -hmm. because they're the ones who are closest to the action and therefore more likely to understand what's happening and because they're closer to the action uh, and they're not sort of in far removed in a long decision making chain they're the ones who are, ca or who are most able to act quickly so so what starts off as a, a kind of a rather arcane debate about systems and processes very quickly becomes a lot about how you manage people and yep. specifically how do you build a process which facilitates distributed control yep. where you allow people to make decisions close to the action to make decisions, but to do so in a controlled way. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll come on to that in, in a minute. But I guess that comes we, down we to we that safe to failure yeah. with, um, with uh, what's sort of guardrails, a lot of people talk about yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah, failure yeah. within confines or whatever it is. Yeah, so I have a lot, boundaries. I mean, within boundaries, that's the word I'm yeah. looking for. Um, yeah. So a lot of questions here is that, um, uh, what, what stops this from just being a lot of mini waterfalls? Um, do you say it's the iterative process here? Uh, yes, it's, um, right. It's, it's, it's a, it's a good question. I think number one is that you never, the, the situation is never sufficiently well understood and stable for yep. one coherent plan to ever emerge. Yep. And secondly, uh, every, everything is changing, but at different rates. Mm -hmm. So if you like at, at you, you can conceive in an organization of different kind of recursive levels, uh, yep. decision making levels. And some things are changing very quickly at the low levels, at higher levels, they're changing um, less quickly and so on and so forth. So you've got a, a, if you like, a machine where the parts are related, but they're moving at different velocities. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the link between them isn't, it isn't a tight, rigid coupling. Mm -hmm it is a looser coupling. So it's yep. a bit like kind of riding a bike <laughs> where it's, it's, it's a fundamentally an unstable system and is only made and it, and you, you only avoid falling off by making lots of minor adjustments as you go along. Yep. You know what I mean? It's always teetering on the edge of, of instability, but it's that, that, um, 
it's that dynamic equilibrium that gives the 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 organization its kind of poise and its ability and its ability its fast reflexes it, it sounds also <laughs> no no i i think it i'm, I'm starting to see a, a world emerge where um finance people finance staff members are much more consultative rather than hey see you next year after the you know when the next budget oh yeah um, yeah. it's a, it's a highly social, highly ongoing, where they really understand what's going in the business and making those corrections as you've talked about, okay, a little less over here, a little bit more over here to make sure that things are um, yeah. balancing uh, like you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and coaching people, because we tend to assume that, I, I think we all do, don't we? We all assume that what's obvious to us, to us it will be obvious to, is, is equally obvious to everybody, but mm -hmm. it, it absolutely is not the case. So, um, very often people need to be helped to understand the financial and broader business consequences of decisions which they're making from a very local perspective. Yep. And, and I, finance people, I think, have, a, have, a, have an important role there as well. Okay. And what, what, what kind of cycle does this usually run to? Um, are we talking... We've, we've talked about yearly, but do we go down? And I know it depends on the organization from, I guess the answer is, but is your typical beyond budgeting cycle monthly or how does that work? Well, it's, you know, it, it's, it, it does all depend, but mm -hmm. um, I think this is one of these areas where, where the perfect is the enemy of good. So, <laughs> Find out what works for you. Like is it's just start start off doing doing it with an, an annual cycle and with an annual horizon and then as you learn change it so it works better for you yeah um so you could sit down and do a kind of theoretical piece of exercise a theoretical exercise which uh, leads to a perfectly designed process after two years of of intense intellectual endeavor or you could just yep. start and 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 learn as you go along. Yeah. The, the, the biggest- let's start with your of, current annual process using the Beyond Budgeting Method and go for, and- Yeah, it yeah, but that. just yeah. Don't, don't try to, don't fool yourself that whatever, whatever you're doing on your annual cycle is perfect. Don't, don't yep. invest any more time in it than is strictly necessary. I mean, fundamentally, what you're doing, it's all about information. Yep. information in the context of resource allocation decisions mm -hmm. so i always say to people start with what decisions what resource allocation decisions do you need to make mm -hmm. and then work back from that to say what information do you need to be able to make those decisions well mm -hmm. and then you build build back from there yeah um i guess the decision of just is, sorry go ahead yeah no no I guess the decision of just saying, hey, when we're going to try something that's not the traditional annual method and we're going to potentially move to a six monthly or, or quarterly cycle, mm -hmm. even, if, even that's just a huge leap in a mindset for, yeah. for anyone in that environment. Yeah, it's a mindset thing. The key thing is, uh, you know, if that's what you're, you're going to do, don't and it's going to lead on to, to, the, to the next slide, is, mm -hmm. is don't, beyond budgeting is not budgeting done twice as frequently. This is the point I'm trying to make. So yeah. it's got to, it's, as we talk about in a lot of Agile, like you don't just do mini waterfall, you, you make your planning lightweight. So yeah. Yeah. how is beyond budgeting yeah. lightweight? Yeah. yeah. So if you go into the next slide. Mm -hmm. So, the, the fundamental problem with traditional budgeting is it, it you, is it's one process trying to do six different things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a process that's used for target setting, it's a process to use for planning and forecasting, it's a process used for resource allocation as the basis for measurement, as a, very often the basis for rewards, as a basis for coordination. And, and the key insight into moving from a budgeting environment to a beyond budgeting environment is, is to recognize you've got six separate processes and what you should be aiming to do is to create the, the 
the mechanisms and procedures that enable you to serve each of those six individual processes uh, purposes best so uh, the classic example is targets and forecasts in budgeting you try to you using the same number for both mm -hmm. your target is also your forecast whereas if you think about it your target is an aspiration yeah where well, your forecast mm -hmm. is an expectation mm -hmm. the two are fundamentally different there will be different numbers mm -hmm. your target might not change very frequently mm -hmm. but your expectation will change all the time because things shit happens and you have and, the most up-to-date information yeah yeah most up-to-date information and you will be consciously changing your plans to bring your forecast your expectations into line with your aspirations but then by the time you do that things will have changed again and so on and so forth it's so, really funny when i hear this it really kind of ties so well into things like okrs so your objective is always to um you know that big hairy goal which you may never yeah. reach but your yeah. key results are always changing to kind of drive yourself to, to your edge to grow to move yeah. towards that and yeah. that's exactly what you're saying with targets and and, and yeah. our target may always be we're going to grow by 20 percent, but if we're on we're only on track for 15 or 10 percent, our expectation needs to change or, or yeah so or we need to change how are we going to make it different yeah Correct. and we're not gonna we're not going to get there by by trying to enforce compliance to a plan that's now out of date and was probably yeah, exactly. to start with. So you need yep. to, so Rod, so the trick is to decompose this uh, control system into its individual parts and say, what's the purpose of target setting? What's the purpose of resource allocation? What's yep. the purpose of measurement? And what's the best way of fulfilling that those purposes and, and and build your control system from that um mix mm -hmm. rather than try to force everything into the straitjacket of traditional budgeting so I, I i'm not going to go through each one of these in detail because that will take up a long a lot of time yeah I, th I think for the people on the podcast, though, we're yeah. looking at a slide that says targets, plans, resource allocation, measurement, reward, and coordination. Yeah. What you're saying is the, the building blocks of what of a budgeting process, regardless of um, regardless of what you use. Um, but in this case, yeah. we just reorganize those pieces. Yeah. 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 So it's a control process. And these are the components of the control process. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So, and, and if we're talking in the context of the, um, the tool that's on the comparative agility site, what mm -hmm. the Beyond Budgeting um, <clears throat> tool does is it's chopped into three chunks. First chunk is basically trying to assess where you are now uh, and basically referencing to the sort of traditional problems, the problems we see in traditional processes. The yep. second chunk is trying to assess where people are with respect to the beyond budgeting principles, six of which are process principles of, of, of the kind that uh, you've just described and six are organizational principles. Yep. So that's the second chunk. The third chunk is to try to get a sense of what people believe is possible. Um, so that the, in a perfect world, if you like, from our perspective in Beyond Budgeting, people recognize their current process is rubbish. Uh, they will then discover that reason it's rubbish is that their current processes and the way they organize themselves is a million miles away from, from Beyond Budgeting. And they'll recognize that there is a lot of potential in the business which is not being realized as yeah. a result. Yeah. I yeah. think, as I was saying before, I think just even thinking how things can be done differently is a huge step. And I'm, I'm trying to parallel this to our job. I'm not seeing the, the same thing because um, as you pointed out, this is reinforced by a hundred years of uh, financial dogma and even the way that our markets are structured, um, which I'll get to in a minute. But um, once that those possibilities open up, there is a lot of possibility there. Well, I mean, yeah. we just said that, yeah. but yeah. the mindset of, wait a minute, we can change is we can make it better is a very inventive uh, uh creative mindset so yeah 
yeah, yeah, and and, and ultimately, the end at the, the end of the day, this wouldn't be worth any of us within the Beyond Budgets community spending any time on it if it, if we didn't sincerely believe at the end of the day it results in better business performance. Yeah, that was a whole Correct. bunch of other reasons why it's it's a good thing to do, but fundamentally, most sort of hard-headed business people won't get out of bed unless they believe it's going to lead to better results at the end of the day. And we, we sincerely do. We've got 20 years of experience and, and quite a few cases to demonstrate that that's possible. Yeah, understood. Okay, so next slide. So the traditional organisation we've kind of talked about is around compliance and command. It's all about compliance and command and uh, I, I, it's something I call a functional hierarchy because it's a, a power hierarchy. The people at the top have the power, they're the ones that make yep. decisions. And it's functional in that the assumption is that if you specialise, that will generate economies of scale and those economies of scale will mean that your costs are lower and you make more money. So that's the kind of fundamental assumption with a traditional organization and yeah. it's predicated as i said earlier on, on two things one is that uh, uh, that all the clever people are at the top um yeah. and the stupid people are at the bottom and they're stupid and untrustworthy and they need to be able to uh, they need to be made to comply to the clever people's plans and yeah. they will only do that if you uh, hit them with sticks and dangle carrots in front of them. Yeah, it seems um, a bit. It seems a bit almost uh, fantastical to think. Okay, there's someone at the top. The higher you go, the higher that the more they know, and they know exactly what's going to be happening in a year's time, like some sort of oracle. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's um it's the kind of leader as czar um, yeah. approach, and it fits very nicely with a kind of uh, leader has hero narrative. It's a nice story. Uh, you've got goodies and baddies and... <laughs> but also, I think... All uh, that kind of stuff. And there's one yeah. way to do it. And you read this business book and learn the secrets of success and you too will be successful. It's, it's, kind, of, it's, a kind, of, it's a kind of fairy tale for grown-ups. Yeah, uh, I guess I, I would agree with that in some respects. And... Um, it's really based upon that idea that, as I was saying, that someone just knows everything, but it just yeah. seems impossible, especially in today. That's what I'm trying to get at is that in today's world, more than ever, we're slowly moving to a point just like we've had with our, um, with our recent upheaval in the coronavirus. It's like no one knows the future. And it's starting to become very clear that no one knows yeah. the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, all you can do is react and learn to as you go. Yeah, and, and in a coordinated way. Mm. I mean, if just as a sort of a kind of reference point, the traditional model was developed in the 1920s when, you know, we were just moving from an era where everything was owner, owner run, owner controlled into mm. multi-divisional management. GM was the first sort of, GM and DuPont were the first sort of classic businesses where professional managers were brought in. And if you think of Ford in 1924, the majority of people who worked in Ford did not speak English. Yeah, Why because they're immigrants. They're immigrants. Yep, got it. Yep. Yeah, and they couldn't. Most of them couldn't read or write. You know, so all of this was born out of an environment where. Uh, you, you had to tell people what to do mm -hmm. because they didn't have the, uh, it's not that they, they, they weren't clever enough, but they didn't have the, the education, the con social and cultural conditioning to be able to make intelligent decisions yeah. At, at, yeah. at work. Whereas now it's, it's almost the other way around, you know, that, 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 the world is changing so quickly that, you know, there, there are CEOs out there who don't know how to use a computer. Yep. And there are supposedly that the most junior people in the business can code. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost inverted. Yeah. You know, and these are the people who are going, you know, these are the senior leaders going on to 
going into business conferences about digital transformation. It's all that. Yeah. It's, it's a good joke. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, com it's completely reversed. Um, yeah. and, and the assumption that, as you say, the people at the top know best. I mean, obviously they've got experience and they've got where they have done because of, you know, because they've done well, but yep. the assumption that knowledge, expertise, and the ability to make good decisions sits at senior levels is, is kind of patently false. Well, one way I look at it is, I mean, there are, let, let's not be uh, naive here. There's a lot of really smart people, as you said, with a lot of great experience sitting at those levels. But one other factor is uh, information flows. Information is flowing yeah. in real time all the yep. time um, and yep. if there is a lag time as we've said before yep. between a latency yep. between the information being generated and it reaching yep. the top of that pyramid yep. whereas if the people on the front line are given the authority authority and decision making power that exists at the top down the bottom and they're the people with literally the most up-to-date information absolutely because of because of the ways we can gather process and visualize yep. information yep 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 those people yep. on the front lines can make those decisions Yep, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and the, the other thing is that the, the amount of, I mean, the, the, when the traditional management organization was conceived, I mean, there were no computers, telephones had only just been invented. Correct. Uh, there weren't calculators. Yep. You know, th th there was very little information. And, and even back to the start of my career, you know, it was a major struggle to get information. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I had to put in a capital proposal for my first calculator. <laughs> How much was your first Seriously? calculator, may I ask? I've still got it. I think it was about 20 pounds, so it'd be about 600 okay. pounds in today's money. <laughs> um, it's a great calculator. I mean, I, I, I should have brought it with me. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, it, it, the information was very scarce, and, and also it was, you know, we, as accountants, we spent, used to spend all the time reconciling numbers that were different from different places. Whereas now, the capacity to generate data and information is way outstrips the capacity of a, a single brain to absorb it. I so agree. So even if there was no latency, yep. the a senior person would get completely overwhelmed. And that's yep. why you've got to have distributed not only dis distributed decision-making processes, but distributed information processing yep. processes. Yeah. Because it can't be centralized. Um, yeah. And it's a natural, you know, it's a natural consequence of, uh, of uh, you know, living in a data-rich environment. So you have to design the organization differently, if, if, if you like the... The control system, it's a bit like the kind of, I mean, I don't know very much about this, so maybe I should, I should go here, but yeah, as I understand it, the difference between 4G and 5G is that in 5G, a lot of the information is distributed. The, yep. Sorry, the processing is distributed mm -hmm. rather than centralized. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's the principle sense. of edge, edge networks yeah. everywhere. Um, yep. And that, that wouldn't surprise me considering the amount of edge computing that at Microsoft is pushing on their Azure platform. And it really just kind of, uh, it's, not, it's not a new concept. We've been doing edge processing for content for a long time, but it makes sense in an information point of view because it's waste transferring information rather than, if it can be processed at, at that point, yep. any sort of transferring or movement is, is a waste of the entire system, so. Yep, yep, yep. And it's exactly the same. Uh, from an organizational point of view. So design so. your organization to allow as many decisions as possible to be taken as close as possible to the market, consistent yep. with maintaining overall control and organizational cohesion. And this is where aligned autonomy comes into the, the process yeah. again, is that you want to give people as much as autonomy as possible to make those decisions as you've talked about, but when they do it in an aligned fashion, which is where your strategies and goals you're talking about before being absolutely crystal clear on that and communicating yep. regularly, 
as long as you decisions you make align with these strategies and these goals, you, you're you're gold. You're good. Yeah. Just just yeah. make sure you're 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 feeding the information about your uh, th those objectives and the the um what you're hitting up, and we should be okay. Yeah, yeah. That is, and that's the feedback loop. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in a decentralized organization is accountability, support and guidance, which you just talked about. So yeah. we have yeah. aligned, we have alignment through our goals and information. We have accountability, um, but also autonomy. Um, I, it, it's, it's that goal. It's that old saying um, from Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. Um, <laughs> it's not just about, Hey, here's all the, here's all the decision-making power, but with the decision-making power comes uh, accountability and responsibility yeah. to perform to that. Yep, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, if you want to skip to the next slide, the yeah. we we've, we've kind of broken that back into six organisational principles, which um, oh yep, yep. Yeah. So, so the structure instead of being hierarchical, we've defined roles based on economies of scale, much more moving towards more much more distributed decision making and its self organisation yeah. within limits. The purpose be sort of enroll everybody in the purpose rather than purpose simply yep. becoming transactional, you know, do what you're told. Uh, authority distributed but clearly defined because you, you, uh, you, you need, in order to be able to operate much more loosely, you need much greater discipline. It's kind of a paradox. But it's 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 mirrored, I think, very much in the way that kind of modern armies work. You know, yep. you have platoons which have an enormous amount of decision making authority, but that's within the context of extremely clear um, yep. guidelines and enormously and, and having that having been an enormous investment in training in those individuals. Yeah. So control instead of being compliance is more about uh, about about achieving goals rather than so what what you do rather than rather than how you get there mm -hmm. uh, information sharing being critical to that and also <clears throat> the value system and the, and the culture in which all that takes place needs to be um, again <clears throat> one that um, is shared and respected um so so that it isn't just you know it doesn't so it it matters how you get there mm -hmm. yeah um so it seems to be that the, i mean for this to work just like any system good system is you're going to have to have clear understanding uh of goals objectives but also clear understanding and shared information or or or, or views of reality yeah um, in order to make decisions and allow people to operate within those boundaries. So. Yeah, and, and information sharing is, is itself a form of control because mm -hmm. if, if, if you know your peers can see what you're doing and how you're doing, that itself is a form of control you know, mm -hmm. that, um, that doesn't require a, central, a centralized authority. Yep, understood. Yeah, so those are the six beyond budgeting principles. So there are six uh, process principles and six organizational principles. Yeah, so there's just for everyone, anyone listening, that structure, purpose, authority, control, information, and values. The yeah. purpose, authority, control being the governance, um, and the information and values being classed as enablers. That's right. Which makes a lot of sense. Okay. That's right. Which is so, very similar to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it should be very similar to the Agile audience. So I, I thought just to kind of finish up, um, what I'd do is just give you my kind of take on how uh, a beyond budgeting approach to business and Agile development practices at a very nitty gritty level, how, how they what that interface looks like. So I'm, I'm, I'm now going to take some appalling liberties <laughs> and, and try to describe a, a, a subtle and sophisticated 
process like agile development in about uh, two sentences. <laughs> Looking but, forward to it. Let's do it. <laughs> so what, what I say, the sort of fundamental characteristic of, of everything which is characterized as agile is that you have um, progress towards a defined per goal uh, that takes place yep. in an iterative way. So you've got feedback loops and as far as possible, that feedback loop should be driven by feedback from customers or proxies for customers. Yeah. Um, that uh, is translated into a, 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 it, it, into a set of prioritized needs, which are constantly re-evaluated in the yep. context of that learning process. So in a, that, that, Kind of agile process can exist within a traditional budgeting framework um, where you start off with you know your budget is a million pounds and you succeed by getting as close as possible to your defined purpose within that constraint of a million pounds mm -hmm. but uh, the way i would turbocharge this in a beyond budgeting environment is to say look that approach is a bit like kind of traditional betting where you place a bet on a horse race before you've seen the horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're making a, a commitment of a million pounds to bet on this horse called project a, but yep. you have no idea how good that horse is. Yep. It'd be much better to, I mean, cause betting is a resource allocation process. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's better. a funny thing. The best yeah. best punters as it is actually are much more risk averse by having multiple bets going at the same time. And exactly, exactly. Which one goes on? So yeah, so far better than placing all your money on a horse. Yep. Uh, in a, in a condition of utmost uncertainty. Yep. It would be to play to bet in play, so that you adjust the amount of of money that you put down based upon what you learn by seeing yep. the horse race. Yep. So if you, if you just like to click on, so to start yep. off with, you really don't know very much about this horse. So if you just click on again, yeah. So you start off by making a small bet. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then you get bigger. Yeah. When, when you're about a third of the way through the race and it's cleared the first five hurdles, and you see how it's running compared to its peer, you, you increase your bet. And then when you get to a certain point, you put all your money down. Now, yeah. and you may end up putting more money down on this horse than the million pounds that you would have committed to it uh, in a traditional budgeting system. Because this but might you're be saying, a really you, you, good horse. Yeah, but you're <laughs> so saying, you see, you know the value you're receiving. So it's really less yeah. about cost and more about value. Exactly. But if the horse falls at the first hurdle, you stop. Yeah. Yeah. There is no uh, incentive to carry on spending up to your million pound budget because that would just be throwing money away. Yeah. So and this, this maps really well to other things we've seen around um, lightweight prototyping and the product and UX curves about yeah. um, keeping risk low until you have a proven sort of value as you're talking yeah. about and then being able yeah. to ramp up costs yeah. or associated yeah. with that and it, yeah. it, it aligns very well with the, the kind of eric reese's lean startup stuff as well yeah um yeah. and it, it's it's basically what vcs do mm -hmm. yeah which is you know you a simple low-cost prototyping being uh, prepared if stuff doesn't work to throw it away and start again yep what you're trying to do is to is to validate a a value hypothesis mm -hmm. yep. as early as possible and then when you've got a good value hypothesis you look to see if you can validate a growth hypothesis and and yeah. and you scale your resource commitments in line with what you learn um so, so coming back to you yeah sorry go ahead yeah no no 
I've, coming I've back to it. investors as you kind of about that was one of my questions so traditionally when someone's building a, a, a an investment document or something like that they'll have to say i need two million dollars over the next two years and that will be mm -hmm. their series a or something like that so how do you how does beyond budgeting really work with that uh, i i i think it fits very it fits very naturally with it just depends what kind of investment process you're talking about with this yeah, as long as internal you're, in, yeah. internal kind of project investment or whether you're talking about kind of startup company type investment but yeah it's I mean, a similar thing with agency because the, the question that's really going on there is i will give if i give you two million dollars you'll build this where it's like the, the conversation needs to change to say that okay we believe in your team we believe in your methods yeah um I'm sure you'll use this money appropriately. Um, again, and it's the same with, um, I guess it's just as hard with publicly listed companies, which you need to make promises a year in advance. And then how does this yeah. all match together? And there's a whole uh, separate conversation about that because I think there's okay. a lot of myths around it. But, but I'd say, I mean, if, if, you're, if you're in, like, let's take a startup company mm -hmm. as, a, um, as an example. You, you're, you're never going to get anybody to invest in a startup, an angel, let's say, yeah. in the very, very early stages, unless that you have some idea of mm -hmm. how big this could become. Yep. But so if you think it's going to be a hundred million dollar business, but no angel is going to say, and here's $10 million to make that hundred million business. What they'll say is, okay, that seems plausible. Here's half a million. Yeah. Let's see you do the first bit. Yep. I'll, I want to see that you've got the, the, the technical ability to build something and that there is some evidence that this is something that potential consumers would value. Mm -hmm. And then you have another conversation, which is, so what's the next step? So whilst there might be an overarching, if you like, aspiration for a hundred million dollar or billion dollar company the resource is only committed yeah in the context of getting to the next step because yep. in the process of getting to that step you're acquiring knowledge you're reducing uncertainty mm -hmm. so you're you're matching the amount you're prepared to commit to your confidence that that is a worthwhile investment Yep. So you're betting in play. You're not placing a big bet at the start of the race before you've seen the horse. Yep. Understood. And that's it. It's all pretty simple, really. <laughs> well, that's where the rubber hits the road, right? So we've <laughs> talked about agile resource allocation, talked about the money, and that's really it. Yeah. Um, but it's really the beginning because uh, I guess the, the first step is to really go to the Comparative Agility website and kind of use the capability and see where you stand right now. But you're, you're telling me from a yearly point of view, you can actually move into beyond budgeting relatively simply as a part yeah, there of... Are lo there are lots of ways in um, and I, I think wherever you start is... That, that, that's a decision which you have to make in your particular business context, which is a function of your business, the challenge it's making, but also where you sit in the organization. Yeah. Um, so, and uh, so that's a decision which you, you have to make in that particular context, but that there, there the, the notion that some people might have that, you've got to have a burning platform and the CEO has got to be hundred percent knowledgeable and committed to it before you make a start. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think that's, uh, that's, that, that's um, a false assumption for any kind of change and yeah. not just build budgeting. Yeah. And you can go to the beyond. I think it's really important for people if they're interested to go and see those principles and the, the building blocks around the, the, the mindset at the beyond budgeting website, which you can just, Yep. search for and be able to see but this has been very enlightening for me it seems to it's, it's really for me uh inspiring to see how a lot of these methods used for different things actually work well together when we talk about agile team development we talk about okrs and we talk about beyond budgeting they seem to all 
have the same uh, inspiration of that progressive, um, more uh, exploratory realization that we don't know everything and we need to get better at not knowing everything and being uncomfortable yeah. And, yeah. and changing as we go. Yeah. And it's not an accident. It, no. <laughs> it's not an accident. It, it's not by design, but it's yep. not an accident because everybody is responding in a uh, intuitively to the same signals from the world, which is, we don't know. Yep. We don't know. And we've got to work out a way of dealing with a world where we don't know in advance, but, but we still have to make progress, stay organized, work together collectively. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Uh, My pleasure. I learned a lot and have a great day. And you, and you. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye.